This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and today we are going to look a little deeper into NASA and SpaceX's plan to bring us to the moon for a more permanent venture. We've not seen a human presence on the lunar surface since 1972, but all of that is about to change. After NASA chose SpaceX as their sole provider of the Human Landing System, or HLS for short, space enthusiasts such as us here have been incredibly excited for such a mission to eventuate. That would once again capture the excitement of people all over the world. Now, it is true that the award from NASA is currently in a weird state of limbo with all of the recent protests from both Blue Origin and Dianetics. It is expected that SpaceX will hold on to this award, along with, we hope, at least one other contractor as new awards are announced. So this video focuses on the latest information about the award for SpaceX, what we do and don't know about the mission. But why do we see this as such a big deal? Well, not only will this help to further our journey in becoming an interplanetary species, but it will also inspire that curiosity in people all over the world when we once again witness astronauts step on another celestial body. Almost half a century ago we visited, but this time we aim to stay. The construction of a permanent lunar settlement aided by reusable launch systems is the very first step towards reaching these new technological heights, and it's a stepping stone, if you will, that enables us to reach out to further destinations in our solar system, notably, of course, Mars and the asteroid belt. Strap in, because this is going to be an interesting topic. As many of you are already aware, we have just recently seen the first real concrete proposal that we have to get us back to the moon after nearly half a century. A few months ago in April 2021, SpaceX was chosen by NASA to develop, manufacture and fly two lunar missions with the Human Landing System or HLS Starship. This will be a fairly substantial variation on the Starship that SpaceX has been testing over the last year or so in Boca Chica. The overall plan would be to utilize this version of the Starship as a system to transfer crew and cargo to and from the lunar surface. Now at this stage we only have a vague idea of the engine performance and the dry mass of this vehicle. Those stats just haven't been released in any degree that is overly useful, but we can infer a few things from what has been said in the source selection statement that NASA has recently shared. In that document we discovered a specific line that states that SpaceX's capability contemplates reusable hardware, leverages common infrastructure and production facilities. This specific point is huge as it explicitly defines reusable hardware as a future choice, but not necessarily as the primary option bid for the human landing system contract. Taking all that with a grain of salt, I think it's useful to be able to check out the potential outline for a future Starship lunar mission incorporating reusability. Although this may not be how the initial two missions play out, it is interesting to talk about what could be further down the track. The first step of a round trip reusable lunar Starship mission begins with placing the ship in a high elliptical Earth orbit. This orbit would be similar, I guess, to a geostationary transfer orbit utilized for communication satellites. Based on that assumption, we can estimate that the orbit at the lowest point, or the perigee, being at a minimum of a few hundred kilometers. At the highest point, or apogee, around 42,000 kilometers in altitude. Keep in mind that refueling the ship in this orbit would take a much larger number of Starship tank emissions than if we were to leave from a low Earth orbit instead. This all depends on the vehicle mass and how much payload would be intended to be placed on the lunar surface. Based on quite a few unknowns, a rough estimate of 15 to 20 tank emissions could be involved in this refuel process. Because those tankers would be fully reusable though, that may still be a viable option. Once the HLS Starship is fully fueled in this already high elliptical orbit, the translunar injection burn at this point is actually quite minimal and would leave the vast majority of propellant for the remainder of the mission. From here, it can begin the main goal of reaching lunar orbit, or specifically a near rectilinear halo orbit. The injection burn into this orbit is initially cheaper than going directly from Earth orbit to low lunar orbit. And really, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get there with no crew on board. Whatever is the most efficient is the best here. 
So now that this ship is in that lunar orbit, an Orion spacecraft can be launched via the Space Launch System with crew and their supplies for the mission included. Tony Bella has created some wonderful renderings to show how Orion and Lunar Starship would dock through the nose hatch. Just beautiful work there, and it looks a little bit like they would switch from a PLP-50 to a deluxe sized motorhome. All of this action of course would happen in the Halo orbit, and after all preparation is complete, the surface bound ship would disconnect from Orion and begin a burn to lower the orbit all the way down to low lunar orbit. So now comes the exciting burn, the burn to finally touch down on the surface of the moon. We can see here that they will need to likely switch to the smaller engines far up on the HLS to avoid blasting too much of the moon's dust out into orbit. Once landed, all of that wonderful surface activity and science can continue, and at this point the ship would begin and complete its primary surface mission, and once finished they can undertake the ascent preparations. To get off the surface to meet back up with Orion, a significant amount of propellant is required which would have been left over from the initial refueling around the Earth. This propellant will be used for the surface to low lunar orbit burn and then soon after another burn to meet up with Orion. Once these two burns are complete it is now time to set up the rendezvous and the docking with the Orion spacecraft so that we can return the crew and cargo that is going back to Earth. At this stage SpaceX's primary mission with NASA with the Lunar Starship is now completed. Anything that could happen from here is just gravy. In an optimal scenario, the ship would be returned all the way to be reused again. Now we think there could be just enough delta V to allow for this if all the preceding scenarios were done accurately and efficiently, therefore meaning with a low cost maneuver the ship could make its way back to a high elliptical orbit around the Earth. It would be extremely empty and needing to be fully refueled again. As noted before, the ship's recovery is not the primary mission of the human landing system, therefore taking longer to recover the ship is not a drawback to the overall outlook for the Artemis missions themselves. With all that said, there is a lot of hypothesizing and speculating given that we don't have the accurate information on the ship's dry mass or the specific impulse available by the Raptor engines. Let us know if you think this is possible and if our suggested mission profile does actually fit the bill of what is necessary to meet the goals of a fully reusable lunar starship. So yes, the main benefit of all this is this can do what NASA wanted a lunar lander to do anyway, plus a lot more. While the competitors focused on creating a vehicle specifically for landing, SpaceX simply proposed some alterations to their already designed vehicle to convert it to a lunar lander. This is why the scale of this solution is just so much larger than Dynetics HLS and then Blue Origin's national team's integrated lander vehicle. This becomes especially apparent when you examine NASA's original Artemis program promotional videos where it shows a smaller lander being separated from an Orion capsule to land on the moon. Compare this with the massive Starship and it does beg the question as to why NASA decided to go with this design so different from what they envisaged. Of course a good benefit for NASA choosing Starship as their lander if they do believe that this will be the spacecraft of the future is that they will now have more oversight in how Starship will be developed in this area. Assisting and funding SpaceX in order to create a spacecraft that is aligned with their vision for the upcoming decades in space exploration is going to be hugely exciting. Now some of the most notable differences between the HLS versions of Starship and the traditional Starship is that there is no need for a heat shield or fins, a huge reduction in mass right there. Of course the traditional Starship has been designed to return to Earth after launching, but that is not the case with the HLS variation. This variation will be operating entirely within the vacuum of space, making these atmospheric components unnecessary. When it comes to the actual lunar landing, instead of using the beefy Raptor engines all the way to the surface, here we see some smaller and more precise landing thrusters. These thrusters are not currently known or have a name, but we can assume that they will exist as they have been seen in the renderings provided during the initial development period. The assumption that I have is that these will be powerful hot gas thrusters that will derive their fuel from the existing stores of liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Another hot topic of debate is of course the landing legs. The traditional Starship is going to require deployable, heavy duty and reusable landing legs. The Moonship however can be designed with larger landing legs for added stability on the lunar surface. These will only need to support lunar gravity so could be substantially lighter at the same time. Two very different goals there. Moving back up the ship to the nose we see the docking port mentioned earlier which is in place now of the liquid oxygen header tank seen in the current Starships. 
In fact, we could assume that there is no need for header tank systems at all for this version of the ship. Unlike those aggressive flip and landing burns that are done here on Earth, in a vacuum they can simply use reaction control thrusters to slowly settle fuel into the bottom of the tanks before firing up the main engines. So yes, that is another weight saving and simplification of this particular vehicle. Also, one of the greater benefits of Moonship, or rather the Starship program overall, is the capability to deliver massive payloads to orbit and also deliver it to the lunar surface. Think of all of the supplies, research equipment and science that can be delivered. With that capability, we can expect a lot more surface activities, lunar samplings and long duration missions. So this brings us back to the selection document which includes the sentence which states that SpaceX's capability contemplates reusable hardware. That word right there, contemplates. Now we've obviously just talked about a fully reusable scenario, but I think that another exciting option could exist if it wasn't reusable. Could there be enough fuel margin to return the Starship back to the surface to land and stay? Allowing it to remain on the surface could be a massive benefit for future missions. This would mean that by the end of the two missions, missions there would be two massive habitable surface bases along with all of their life support equipment that could be utilised. This could prove to be especially useful as the beginning of Moon Base Alpha which Elon Musk has referenced numerous times now. Now what do you think? I just love this stuff having been a space exploration fan much of my life. I believe this upcoming decade may be the most exciting time in space flight history and thank you so much to everybody here for your support and for helping me spread the word. It makes a big difference to the channel here. Now it is interesting I think to look back to why the drive for lunar activity has been essentially non-existent all this time and why these new commercial opportunities are changing the landscape here. Historically of course NASA has been a perfect platform for single launch projects like Apollo but a sustained presence on the moon has always been a little out of their reach. Now there have been some obvious reasons to this. Firstly the setbacks like NASA's post Apollo budget slash. After the space race was won the enthusiasm dropped significantly. Significantly. Over the years this issue has been compounded by a tendency for each presidency wanting to make their own mark on things by changing the focus and direction of mission spending. This essentially means a manned project is rarely stable enough to last for more than a decade. Because of that reason anything other than staying locked in low earth orbit over the last 20 years or so has been quite troublesome. Without that long term political drive to be the first to achieve such greatness, building a much more massive permanent colony on on the moon or even Mars has been near impossible up to this point. We also need to consider that perhaps we went to the moon a little prematurely. We didn't go when we were good and ready and the technology all existed. We rapidly developed the minimum technology needed and the second we were able to meet that goal we were off. Sadly this wasn't primarily due to the collective need to explore and understand the universe. This was essentially due to the pressures created by the Cold War era. NASA and the Apollo astronauts truly believed that a failure to succeed here here would have led to a world dominated by the Soviet Union. As it turned out of course the United States won that space race to the moon with the Apollo program. But where are the new generations of Apollo vessels? After the initial space race was coming to an end the decision was made to create a totally new spacecraft that would better suit the regime at the time. The reusable space shuttle was that solution and that program of course formally commenced in 1972. The thing is this was not a spacecraft to land on the moon. This space shuttle was created to service low earth orbit. Now don't get me wrong I loved the space shuttle and it did amazing things such as deploying and repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. That was a technological breakthrough that I'm sure that we have all had benefit from. But at the same time the capability to explore further was almost ripped away entirely with the retirement of the Apollo vehicles. Looking back that one decision seems to be a huge setback for manned exploration. In more recent history of course after the retirement of the space shuttle NASA's commercial crew program took the lead born to fund vessels that would also be used to send astronauts into low earth orbit. We've already seen technology moving on with new vessels such as Crew Dragon and we hope soon Boeing's Starliner. This I think has been quite a refreshing change. Institutions like NASA, Roscosmos and the European Space Agency just to name a few have only got us so far. Without them we certainly couldn't be here today. But if we really do want to advance space exploration we can't just sit by assuming that things will progress at a pace that is in line with our expectations and capabilities. A private company has much more freedom to operate than a government agency and this excitement is clearly shared by you, the community that has been growing over the past decade. The great thing with 
commercial opportunities though is that there can be concrete longer term visions and this is where SpaceX has thrived. They need to move and they need to move fast. They need to be sustainable and although NASA contracts currently play a huge part in that self funding, it is also critical over the longer term. Starlink is just one of those funding platforms to allow SpaceX to push the next generation of space exploration well beyond what has been achieved in the past. They must give us massive results to survive and wow have they done this so far and more. So yes, you can probably see why we are so excited about this future venture. For the first time in our history, I can see a clear vision for a sustainable presence on the moon's surface and that could be followed by an extremely exciting future. A big thank you to Brilliant Today for sponsoring this video. Now you all know how this works. To spend the needed time to create this content and work alongside our talented editors and script writers, funding support is critical. Brilliant has supported us not just for this video, but many, many others. And that has made a significant impact in how many viewers that we can reach. By supporting what Brilliant are doing, that also supports us here. And they provide hands down the most engaging website and app for learning math and science. It is super fun fun, interactive and accessible and their approach is all based around active learning and problem solving. As soon as you experience some of this, you will understand immediately why it is such a powerful way to learn. Take this new statistics course. Every day we make loads of decisions without necessarily thinking about the bigger picture. A decision can work out in our favour or it could be the opposite. It mostly comes down to the data behind that decision. Learn what questions to ask to have a better chance of making that correct judgment judgment call. Think of the scientists and rocket engineers that need to make important decisions daily using sometimes quite limited information. With this course you'll learn how to frame the questions that you need to ask for statistical analysis and what's more you will have fun learning it too. If you would like to give it a try head over to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. Now, the incredible 3D artists out there that create such wonderful work for the community deserve any attention that you can give them. They are all listed and linked here in the description. They create this stuff because of their love for the industry and also to help educate and illustrate these vehicles. So do support them where you can. We plan on a follow-up that dives even deeper into this HLS topic in the near future. So do subscribe to keep an eye out there for that one. Now, you made it to the end of the video and thank you very much for watching all the way through here. Just providing that constant watch time helps more than you would think. That is just one way that you can help get the word out about the channel that I run here. You could be a regular viewer of my content, perhaps a patron or YouTube member supporting what we do, or you could be picking up some gear from our merch store, including this shirt that I'm wearing today. You can pick that up on a mug, a shirt, a hoodie, and a bunch of other cool stuff. Know this though, no matter how you support us, know that it does make a huge impact on what we can do with the channel, and it also allows me to increase the time that the team and I can collectively spend in research, editing, and quality control. If you like what I'm doing and you'd like to help assist me with what we do directly, you can join up as a YouTube member via the join button below, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Marcus House. Either of those options gives you access to chat to us more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can also have your name listed right here like these other amazing people, and you also get earlier and ad-free access to the videos to watch before anyone else. Thank you to the production crew and the quality control squad here for the amazing assistance each and every week. If you're interested in these topics and you would like to keep up to date, remember to subscribe here below and follow me on Twitter at Marcus House. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video from last week, in the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.